Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mona Aika, and I'm a child protection specialist in UNICEF Eastern and Southern Africa Regional Office, ESARO. A very warm welcome to all the government representatives who are with us today and our partners, Changing the Early Care uh, and the Better Care Network and colleagues, UNICEF child protection colleagues, and the various uh, CSO partners working in the area of care reform in East and Southern Africa region. Before we start, I'd like to, um, to, to start off with a few, uh, to go through some few webinar protocols that will help us to have a smooth and lively session. Uh, maybe before I proceed, I'd like to request Bertha or Emily to administer the poll and to you, dear participants, to um, kindly complete a short poll so that we know who is in the room. Okay, so we have the poll there. Kindly take a few minutes to complete that poll and let us know if you have any problems by using the chat box and typing uh, there directly. Maybe as we proceed with that poll, um, I'd like to uh, also kindly request all the participants to ensure that your microphone, microphone is on mute during the session. Um, and uh, you will be encouraged to type in the chat box any questions and or comments that you may have and we'll ensure that we respond to all questions and uh, acknowledge the comments provided. You may also use the raise hand button if you want to ask um, uh, questions directly um, after the presenters uh, are through with the presentation. And as you've heard at the beginning, this webinar is recorded and will be shared after this session for your reference. Um, also, if you'd like to join the mailing list to learn more about uh, future platform events, and also to receive the uh, newsletter, uh, we will post a link where you can um, uh, access and uh, provide your email. Alternatively, you can also, okay, we're starting to get the results. Should I pause there a little bit? <laughs> I can see we have 40% uh, UNICEF staff, 33% um, NGOs, 7% uh, of the government representative. We're very happy to have you with us today. Uh, we also have 13% of the uh, from the consultancy firms and 7% uh, others. I wonder what others is. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you for completing that. And um, we will still leave the link there in case for others who are joining in a bit later on, they can be able to access and introduce themselves, especially just, which Just going to share. I'm just going to share very quickly one other poll as well, just so we know where people are based. I'll just do that now as well. Okay. Kindly complete that by selecting the right um, area you're connecting from today. <laughs> and we'll also see the results. Just going to take a pause while we get into sponsors. There we go. Aha, uh -huh. so the majority of uh, the participants connecting with us today are from Eastern and Southern Africa at 76% and 24% elsewhere in the world. So we're pleased to see um, various uh, participants who have managed to log in uh, this afternoon uh, for Eastern Southern Africa time. Okay, so maybe let me uh, continue and um, introduce uh, this learning platform. Um, as many of you already know, uh, the regional learning platform on care has been established by UNICEF SRO in collaboration with Changing the Early Care. And the purpose of this platform is really to exchange learning on care across the Eastern and Southern Africa region. So we are pleased to see the majority of the participants are from the region. Um, the, ma the management of this platform is supported by a consultancy firm uh, by the name Child Frontiers. And we have um, Emily Dillard, I'm sure you can see her, who is the lead consultant of this work. And Emily is working with a team of consultants. We have Ismail, uh, Bertha, and Martin Punic as well. Um, the regional learning platform on care um, is really um, dedicated for the governments in the region, 
UNICEF and the CSOs in Eastern and Southern Africa and for them to share uh, learning on care. This platform started uh, back in 2020 um, and now we're in um, phase two of the learning platform, which will run up to uh, January 2023. Um, the operationalization of phase two of this platform um, is made possible with the generous funding from the USAID, USAID's Displaced Children and Orphan Funds through UNICEF SRO. Um, so let me um, go straight and um, take an opportunity to introduce uh, what this webinar is all about today. The webinar is on um, harnessing the power of data in care reform efforts. Kindly mute, mute your microphone. I can hear somebody speak. Kindly mute your microphone so that we can get the introduction of this webinar. And in today's webinar, we're going to learn on why data is important for informing care reform and how data can be collected and used effectively. We'll have speakers from UNICEF uh, headquarters, uh, the data and analytics colleagues, and also a speaker from the Better Care Network. And uh, we'll also hear uh, you know, uh, a detailed example on the importance of data in Uganda's care reform processes. Uh, following these um, three presentations, we'll then have a Q&A, a question and answer session. Um, just to note that all the PowerPoints that you're going to see in a minute will be available online and after the webinar, and uh, a Google link will be shared in the chat box. Just to emphasize that um, all the questions that you may have will be taken at the end, but I also like to encourage participants to ask any questions you have as they occur um, during the presentation using um, the chat box there by typing in your comment or question there. So with that, and without further ado, I would, like, I would now like to um, hand over to Emily to introduce the speakers. Over to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Mona, and thanks everyone for joining us for this webinar. Um, I wanted to hand over, first of all, to Florence Martin, who is the Executive Director of the Better Care Network, um, and is going to deliver the first presentation for us. I'm sure many of you are very aware of the work of the Better Care Network and are using it. It's a fantastic resource that we all rely on to get uh, valuable information on children's care. Um, it's an interagency network that facilitates global information exchange and collaboration on the issues of children without adequate care. And Florence is going to talk to us about why data is so important in care reform efforts and some of the barriers to data collection and also around the use of DHS and mixed data to understand children's care. So over to you, Florence. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm going to try to share my screen, hopefully. Uh, let me know if I achieve that. Are you able to see my screen? Perfect. First of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be um, able and excited to be able to join you um, today. I'm going to apologize. I have a bit of a cold, so I might sound a bit croaky and, and, and coughing. So I hope you can still hear me and understand me, uh, but reach out um, if, you're, if you're not. Um, I'm, I'm particularly happy to be able to speak about this, this question. The issue of data and evidence uh, in terms of care reform is something very close to the heart of Medica Network. Um, and so we're delighted to be, um, to be here today. So I've been asked to start by um, speaking about really why data on children's care is important. And, and I, I know that um, you, you are very aware of that. So I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but. One of the, the, the things that we need to go back to when we, we ask why is data on children's care and care reform important is to go back to the very basis as to why we're doing this work, why children's care is important and what is it. And of course, we go back to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and some of the other international standards that point to the fundamental importance of the fam family environment to children, to their well-being, to their development, to their longer term outcome. And the international commitments made by governments, uh, key stakeholders, around uh, ensuring that children are able to uh, grow up uh, and live and develop in safe, nurturing families. And those commitments are very much focused um, on ensuring that uh, children are able to stay in families, to get appropriate care in families, to go back to families if they've been separated uh, and when it's appropriate. 
um, and uh, uh, including the extended family. So that, that it really is the framework. And of course, it's based on decades of evidence in relation to um, child well-being and outcome in different forms of care. So the, the implication of this in terms of what needs to be done, uh, um, there are really two folds. One, which is around uh, that implementation of the, the child's right to, to family life. And that has direct implications, states have made commitments in relation to what needs to happen. And to start with, and you'll be familiar with this, of course, is the state must ensure that families have access to forms of support to enable them to provide proper care for their children. And that's a fundamental aspect of both the convention, the guidelines on alternative care, but also other conventions like the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And it also means that the state must uh, uh, put in place policies and services to prevent separation, harmful separation. And so that means addressing the root causes that might be driven children away from their families or that might be preventing uh, families to care appropriately for their children or that might lead to abandonment or relinquishment. Um, and the third key element of this is that right applies to all children. And the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability made that clear. The right to grow up uh, in a safe, loving family is also the right for all children with disabilities as well as children from other groups. So this is the first uh, key obligation that relates, and then we'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of data. The second thing, of course, is there are children that actually cannot live in their families or that are outside of family care. And the, 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 probably the most fundamental uh, uh, obligation that relates to that is the recognition that the state is responsible for these children. Once a child is outside of family care, in effect, the state has direct responsibility for that child. The state is the parent. And that is true whether the child is um, living on the street, whether the child is in private institutions, whether the child is um, in any other forms, the, the state, once a child is outside of a parental or family care, the state is directly responsible. And that has uh, in itself a whole a bunch of implication, as you know. One of the implication, of course, is that children that are outside of family care have a right and the state must ensure that they have suitable alternative care and that there is a prioritization on family and community-based care over placement in institutions. So the state must ensure that those services, those alternative care placements are available um, and are appropriately provided to children. The second part is the state has to ensure that children do not go into care and alternative care needlessly. So it has to have very clear gatekeeping procedures to ensure that decisions that are made about children's care and placements are uh, done through a mechanisms that ensure that this is the assessments and that the follow-up and that the placement choices are all being uh, uh, made and reviewed correctly for each child. And uh, a fourth strand of this, which has been reinforced uh, by the General Assembly in 2019 in its resolution, but also in the guidelines on alternative care, is the need to reform system to ensure that the services that are provided are again uh, directed towards family and family-based care whenever possible. So the idea is really reinforcing that children should be in a family environment uh, and that's, that, that it should be supported as such. So <clears throat> related to this, what does it mean in terms of data? What does this obligation, what does this framework mean in terms of data? Well, the first thing is if you're taking the, the right of the child to family life is that the date, there is the need for data that informs not just what happens to children once they're separated, but what happens to children before they're separated from their families. If you're going to be strengthening families, ensuring that they have the means to care appropriately for their children, if you're going to prevent separation, you need to be looking at what happens in families. What are the risk factors? What are the protective factors? What are the situation? And what are the services needed at that level? And that means that you need data in relation to who cares for children. Where are children living? What kind of living and care arrangements um, they're under? What are the situation? What are the drivers of child and family separation? Uh, what are the support needs of these different uh, children and in these different situations? And what are the access to services to enable them to receive that support? And then also, what is the effectiveness and reach of those services? So these are, are fundamental data that are needed by states to enable them to fulfill those obligations in relation to prevention of separation and supporting families to care for their children appropriately. 
And the second part of that uh, coin in some ways is what happens and what is the data needed for children once they are outside the family care. And then we know that again, international standard, the convention, the guidelines are further provided. Um, I've clarified again that with the responsibility to be in effect uh, the parent for the child outside of family care, the state is required not just to provide the alternative care, the suitable alternative care, but to monitor, to regulate, and to oversee the quality and appropriateness of that alternative care. And all of this has major implication for the data that it needs to collect. One of which, and the guidelines, this is directly taken from the guidelines on alternative care, is that it actually needs a complete record of each child in care. That includes the details of placements, the placement, the information on the child's family, data around the regular reviews of placements, efforts that I mean, main and support to enable the child to either go back to his or her family or to an alternative family based more permanent placement. So that type of data must uh, be collected for every child. The other thing, the implication of this is that the state is also responsible to monitor the situation of the facilities and the service providers. And I mean both residential, foster care, uh, you know, this, all of the, the different types of support, adoption, of course, that are being provided to enable children to grow up in families. Um, and that means that all agencies and facilities must be registered and authorized to operate by the social services. And so, again, that has fundamental implication for the kind of data that the state needs. So if the state does not have data around all facilities, and if all facilities are not registered and monitored, it will simply not be able to fulfill its responsibility towards its children. So what does this tell us about what data should be collected? Well, the first thing, of course, is not just a number. As crucial as it is to know, for example, how many children are in foster care, how many children are in kinship care, how many children are in residential care, the question is not just the number. The question is understanding, as, as highlighted, the actual situation and data and information for each child at any given point in time, including what is happening over a period of times. Uh, and, and that means having and collecting both administrative and statistical data at child, at household, and at service level data. You need all of these different data points and these different types of information in order to actually be able to respond to the obligation and fulfill the responsibilities in relation to these children. But it also means we also need data about quality. We need qualitative research. We need data around the impact of interventions. We need data around the longer term outcomes, often longitudinal outcomes. So the, in terms of the evidence that's needed to fulfill those responsibility in relation to children's care, there's a range of data. And I know colleagues from UNICEF and from Palladium will speak about some of those different types of data. And I will speak about um, one, one particular aspect of that. But before that, what are some of the barriers to getting that data, uh, in particularly in relation to children outside of family care? I'm just going to highlight a few. I know you may be very familiar because you're dealing with those barriers in the countries where you're working. One of the biggest questions which relates to that obligation of the states to regulate is that often um, they are very weak regulatory system. And there's a whole range of reasons that we will discuss, but the you often find that uh, a lot of the service providers are unregistered. They are uh, actually off the map. There is uh, very little oversight, and therefore there's very little data that's flowing from the service providers, whether it's those providing foster care or those providing residential care. Part of that picture is that a lot of the funding for the services is actually coming from privately unregulated actors. And often in the relation to children's care, that's, that also includes international funding that is flowing directly internationally into the country. And that makes it very difficult for governments, even with the best will in the world, to actually regulate and get data on, this, uh, on these facilities and these services. Um, and it creates major challenge in terms of data collection. Another challenge relates to decentralization. And decentralization, on the one hand, clearly strengthens the capacity of local governments, local community to deliver the service, to manage them. 
But on the other hand, it also creates some significant challenges if there is no centralized administrative data systems at the national level. So a key part of that must be to also ensure that there is at the national level, a data system that connects to all of the different local authorities and that the data flows at that level. Otherwise, you're simply not going to be, as a government, you're not going to be able to fulfill your responsibility for these children. Another problem are the vested interests that are linked to, particularly with residential care, the orphanage business. And, but it's not necessarily just a business, it's often as well attached to a lot of commitment, a lot of personal belief, social status and faith. And there is a sense that um, in many cases, these actors feel that the state has no business, that what they're doing is well-meaning, they're providing services, why should they provide data? Why should the state be in some ways interfering with their, with their business? So that's one of the, um, one of the challenges um, as well in terms of those political barriers. There are significant resource barriers. Um, the ministries um, in charge and, and, and um, I think colleagues who are coming from, from government uh, office will, will um, probably reflect that, often are coming from ministries that have actually very limited, data, very limited budgets uh, and capacity. And that's often Ministry of Social Welfare. I worked in, in, uh, in Indonesia and in Timor within the Ministry of Social Welfare. And, the lack of resources that these ministries often have to do this really critical work is quite shocking, particularly compared to other ministries, ministries of education, ministries of health. It's often quite interesting to see that in countries that have actually quite well-developed data system for education, for example, have very little uh, um, data system, very little resources in relation to data system for children that are actually very vulnerable and that are part of the, of the child protection system. So that is one of the big challenge. I mentioned decentralization, and decentralization can also not just link to the lack of data connection, but it also can link to local authorities actually having the responsibility for those children and for the services and for the data, but not having the resources. I've been in countries where despite decentralization, the funding is still very much at the national level. The local authorities have the responsibility, but often do not have the capacity. And I, I would be surprised if you didn't have the kind of circumstances that, that I've met, that I've encountered in countries where you have one poor social officer sitting at the district or the sub-district level, which is, who is responsible for a whole plethora of data collection, as well as monitoring, as well as, and that simply is not feasible. You need the capacity, the resource, both human and financial, to do this really critical work. Another part of the resource barrier is in order to really do this work and get collected data, particularly administrative data, you, requ you require significant investment, particularly uh, upfront, but also ongoing in terms of staff and IT that are dedicated to the system. And the final point, which is linked to the, the problem, the challenge in that is often the international assistance, which is crucial to supporting the, establish the establishment of such a system are often project-based. They're often ad hoc, they're short term, they're not sustainable. Setting up the system, of course, is just the beginning of it. The question is then how do you maintain that system and continue to ensure that data flows through it on an ongoing basis? And that's really the hard work. There are also technical barriers um, to data collection. And one of the biggest barriers that, that's um, reflected across countries is the fact, is the question of definition. If you're going to be collecting data, you need to have clarity as to what you're collecting data on and how you classify, how you collect the data in that population. So I, this is an example, for example, from Cambodia, you need to have clarity about what is a group home, what is a residential care facilities, what is a boarding school, is this a mental health facility and are you collecting data in it or is this actually a child care facility and getting clarity around that is both a problem within countries in our experience, but it's also, of course, a problem when you start looking at data across countries and within region. So that is one of the biggest challenge. Another very well known cha challenge of this is that there are often child protection and ethical issues to collecting the data. You're often collecting data in situations particularly when the service providers are unregulated and there's little oversight, where there are significant child protection risk, both to children and at times to staff in terms of providing the data. And so you have to have, as part of your data collection, some very solid uh, ethical procedures, but also child protection procedures, because you will no doubt encounter child protection issues that will need to be addressed. 
A very practical problem that has been encountered in many countries is getting access even to the facilities or to the service providers and to the children. And some of that has to do with the unregulated nature of much of the services, where you might not even be able to actually get through the door. The government might not be able to get through the door. And so that links up to the, the need to have that oversight and that regulatory system. Then you also have to keep that data updated. You have to keep it reliable. You have to keep it confidential. And it speaks really to the data, the administrative data system, which I know colleagues from UNICEF are going to be talking about, which is absolutely fundamental. And as part of that, you also need to address the issue, which is a challenging one of who collects the data and who manages the data and how these link to the system. So these are some of the challenges in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of the data that needs to be collected in relation to children and their care. Um, and I know I, I want to now um, uh, address one of the actually um, a solution to that. There are there is data that is available and it often is actually not being used to the extent that it can. And I want to speak a little bit to this. I know uh, colleagues from UNICEF and Palladium will talk about other types of data that is being collected. But it's important to note that in many cases, the data might actually already be available and we're not making use of it. So it's really critical. And I'm going to speak of particularly the example in relation to uh, the DHS and the mix, the household surveys that provide fundamental, fundamental data about the situation of children that um, might be actually at risk uh, of, of separation and that are um, in families where services are needed to strengthen the capacity of their care caregivers to care for them. So that first types of care data that I mentioned earlier. So many of you are very familiar and probably work very closely with either the DHS, which is um, supported by uh, USAID, or the MIX, uh, supported by UNICEF, which is uh, being done uh, either of the surveys across many of the countries in the region, of course. And it's a fundamental important source of data on children's living arrangements. And that data, and I'll give some example, can actually help us to understand who cares for children, or at the very least, help us to understand who children live with and what are some of the, some of the uh, implication and some of the relationship and linkages to child well-being, to the situation and to other uh, um, uh, indicators of, of child well-being. Um, so it can help us to identify patterns, trends in their living arrangements. And that includes the prevalence of children who are not living with their biological parents, who are not in parental care, but also the prevalence of children that are living in kitchen care, and I'll speak to this a little bit, which is actually the primary form, as you know, of alternative care globally and in your region. Um, and it can also tell us a little bit about the situation of those parents, uh, and therefore what are, some of the, what are some of the findings, what are some of the learning we can make from that data. The important thing to say is that data also gives us the opportunity to disaggregate that data and understand some of the differences in relation to age, in relation to gender, in relation to whether the household is rural and urban, as well as the, the household wealth as well. And it actually provides a lot of very useful data to understand some of those trends and some of these patterns and what some of the, and raises question at what some of the implication might be for child well-being. So this is an example of um, research we did, we actually did, did data analysis a few years ago in relation to the situation through the DHS and the mix. We collected, we looked at the data in both surveys across a range of countries in Eastern and Southern Africa. And we looked at, first of all, the most obvious one, which is, you know, the extent to which children are living or not living with a biological parents. And what does that look like? And one of the key things that come out when you start looking at the data is that the, there is actually a great deal of diversity. The first good news is the vast majority of children are living with a parent, um, but there's also um, significant numbers of children that are not living with a biological parent. And if you can see this data, for example, you can see that the, there's a massive difference, for example, in Namibia, when you have a majority of children that are actually not living with a biolog biological parents, compared to a country like Burundi, where you have a very high level of uh, percentage uh, prevalence of children living with biological parents. But you also have uh, different prevalences of children that are living with a single parent. And what are the implications in relation to their care, but also to the support and the services needed to strengthen their capacity to care? 
Um, Florence, sorry, just before we oh. go, just, just to say just another few minutes, if that's OK. Yes, Thank you. I'm, I'm Thank coming you. to the end. <laughs> so some so. some some key key finding, very top level finding that we found from the from the data analysis that we did. The first thing is we, you know, we estimated that 33 million children in Eastern and Southern Africa are living outside of parental care. And that's a significant number of children. Uh, the majority, and that is the good news in some ways, but it's also very interesting. The majority of these children that are not living with the biological parents have parents alive. In other words, they've not lost their parents. The parents are not dead. And that's actually not unique to this region, but it's interesting because this is a region where often the concept of the issue of orphanhood is raised, particularly in relation to the HIV AIDS crisis. But what we find actually is the vast majority of children are not living with their parents, actually have parents. So the issue is the orphanhood is actually not the main driver for, not, for them not being in parental care. The other thing is there are significant, there are significant variants across region. But there's also significant variance within countries as well. And when you start looking at the data, it actually highlights some real interesting data in terms of the differences within different regions within a country. And it raises questions as why that might be and what are some of the implications for supporting these families. The, the big takeout of the, the data analysis is the vast majority of these children actually are living in relative household. They're living in kinship care. Majority are living, <clears throat> are living with grandparents. But actually we find that um, that also varies tremendously according to their age, according to also the region, according to um, um, the particular area of the country or the particular situation they're living in. But this, this is the kind of data that actually kind of helps you kind of understand what's happening in terms of children's care and who cares for them. This is just, and I'm not going to go into this, but to give you a sense of when you start digging down into that data, in this case in four countries, you kind of realize that actually <clears throat> for children who are not living with their parents, there are a lot of interesting differences in relation to age, in this case each age, which shows that they tend to live in different types of households depending on their age as well. So for example, we found that in many countries, younger children tended to be in households headed by their grandparents. But as the children are, get older, they tend to be uh, headed, they tend to be living with in relative households that are headed by uncles and aunties, or in some cases headed by non-relatives. So age actually is a significant factor in many countries. But again, you've got a lot of diversity. So why, <clears throat> why is this important? Why is this data important? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that there's a significant diversity in family arrangement in the region actually globally as well. And that has implication for the intervention and for our policies. If we're supporting these families, we cannot think there is a cookie cutting, you know, cookie cutting approach to this uh, intervention. We need to understand the different needs of different caregivers in different situations and different families. The second thing is UNICEF has done research and has pointed out very clearly that living arrangements it, uh, are a strong marker of child well-being, independent of orphanhood, <clears throat> excuse me, which is one of the things I was highlighting earlier. And that who children live with, and particularly whether in parents are care or not, has real connotation to their well-being. And so we need to understand this because it, it, it is related as well to child well-being outcome. And we need to understand this better to address and ensure that they're able to get the support and get the uh, um, ensure that, that we prevent separation that can actually be harmful. So one of the things to say is it's essential for, <clears throat> for governments <clears throat> and actors working to strengthen family care, to prevent separation, to make better use of this data and to combine it with the qualitative research that's needed to understand what are the factors behind it. The data through those big household surveys is fundamental to help us identify questions. It doesn't provide the answer to understand why that might be, to understand, but it actually provides us with a um, really important tool to understand what are the kind of questions we should be asking, what kind of other research we should be doing. Finally, the good news is when we did this, um, this data analysis, some of the data was available already through the DHS and NICS report, but the data in relation to children outside of um, you know, not living with a biological parent, in particular, whether they were living in family care or not family care, was not available unless you actually extracted the data. And that is no longer the case. Mix uh, five 
um, is now actually including those stable in its report. If you go to any of the latest mixed surveys, you actually have the tables and you're able to do that analysis yourself directly from the report. The good news is DHS in its latest phase with DHS-8 has made the commitment to also include those tables. Then another aspect of that <clears throat> final point is that there's also work ongoing. In fact, it was piloted in Uganda to actually strengthen the DHS, to revise the DHS modules, the DHS questionnaire, to actually test questions that will also give us much more nuance in terms of care, not just living arrangement, but in terms of the caregiving situation of these children. And again, this is critical data, therefore, to understand actually how we're supposed to be helping and supporting diverse families, and what are the types of services they're accessing or not accessing, and that they might be needed. So I hope this gives you, it's very quick and very overview, but I hope it gives you a sense of, of some of the opportunities with some of those household surveys and data. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Florence. That was an incredibly helpful presentation. And it was nice to end on that positive note of, um, I know you've been lobbying and advocating amongst others for those changes to happen. So it's really exciting that we're gonna to start to get more of that information being routinely analyzed and available. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Ishmael uh, Dudumbo Nyanzi. Um, Ishmael is working on the learning platform um, alongside me, um, but he also has another role as a research and monitoring evaluation and learning specialist um, based in Uganda. And he is a resident advisor for the Data to Impact project in the child protection portfolio. Um, and Ishmael is going to provide us with an example of the use of data and care reform efforts in Uganda. And what I'd like you to do, if you have any questions for Ishmael or Florence, if you could please put them in the chat box. I'll keep track of those and we'll address those before we go to the final presentation. So over to you, Ishmael. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emily. And thank you, Florence, for that wonderful um, sort of a view of why data is important, but also highlighting uh, the different surveys as important source of uh, data. Uh, my presentation, I'm going to uh, share, uh, you know, our experiences uh, from Uganda, uh, especially around strengthening administrative uh, data systems. Uh, and this work, of course, in Uganda spans uh, two uh, different projects. Uh, we began um, working in Uganda in 2017 uh, as part of the, the measure evaluation project and now uh, the data for uh, impact uh, project. Uh, it's, it's also good to see a lot of colleagues from Uganda, so uh, I hope uh, we have <laughs> Uh, you know, I miss out anything, feel free to uh, chip in. So, uh, Data for Impact, just to, to give a little bit of background, Data for Impact is an associate out of measure evaluation. Um, uh, and we, we mainly focus on um, supporting countries to uh, improve uh, the collection and use of data for Uh, health and, and social programs uh, in data collection, reporting and use. And we uh, a lot of our, the work that we are currently doing builds on, um, like I stated in my opening statement, the, uh, the accomplishments under measure evaluation, uh, which ended in March uh, 2020. So a lot of our activities uh, that we do focus on um, uh, strengthening both individual and institutional capacity to generate and use uh, routine data, specifically data on alternative uh, care in Uganda. Uh, I have to, to, to uh, state that our work is, uh, you know, there's a scale of our work is quite limited in terms of uh, geographic scope. So we work uh, closely with the, the, the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development and uh, specifically nine districts out of uh, the 134 districts uh, in the country. So, uh, so what I present here generally represents our work in those nine districts and not necessarily uh, the entire national picture. 
So our approach to uh, strengthening uh, administrative data is largely informed by the logic model for strengthening the use of healthy data in decision making. And much as uh, this model was uh, developed essentially for health data, it has wide applicability to data that is relevant uh, for care reform. And, and of course, in terms of uh, both in terms of the processes, but also in terms of the outcomes. So in terms of the processes, um, our work focuses on, uh, you know, uh, engaging data users and producers, uh, focus on improving data quality, uh, as well as data availability. It focuses on building uh, core competences of actors involved in the um, data uh, flow processes. Uh, so I'm going to highlight some of our work, you know, in relation to uh, some of uh, these uh, processes. So, um, straight away uh, as you can see from the processes the first uh, step usually um, in in the countries where we work is to understand the constraints uh, the, the context as well as uh, the constraints to data collection uh, reporting and use and uh, in uganda we started uh, our work with a participatory care reform assessment uh, much as this focused on the different system component we deliberately uh, focused also on assessing the monitoring evaluation systems as well as the information systems available uh, uh, in the country and the idea was to understand who collects the data what kind of data do they collect where do they report this data what kind of challenges do they face and what kind of institutional support are available to uh, enable them collect and use uh, this kind of data. And of course, this was followed up by uh, site, site visits to different districts to understand the data flow processes, but also to understand the actors and the kind of tools and processes and, and how data you, is used at the different uh, levels uh, in the district. And equipped with that knowledge, of course, we um, we deliberate, we intentionally set out to improve uh, how data is collected, to improve data availability, but also to address questions of uh, quality of data. And during our uh, a lot, the participatory care reform assessment and the site visits, one of the things that came out was a lot of uh, actors were collecting data, but they were not reporting the data because there were no standardized uh, uh, structures and standardized templates, but there, were, there was also no agreement on which uh, indicators uh, they were supposed to report on. So an issue of uh, lack of indicators came out uh, in our, you know, as part as as one of the key constraints uh, to data uh, collection and reporting. So we set out to uh, identify and build consensus around, around a core set of indicators. Uh, and this process initially yielded about 53 indicators uh, gleaned from different policy document, policy and program documents, but also interviews with uh, different stakeholders that were implementing care reform processes. So the next step uh, and I'm glad Kenneth is on the call, was to uh, invite stakeholders, uh, you know, and guide them, you know, guide them on how to narrow down this list because 53 indicators is, is uh, too much for any country. So we developed a prioritization criteria uh, and we invited different stakeholders to apply that criteria. Um, and in the end, we uh, agreed on 10 indicators which are highlighted on the screen and I'll share the presentation for uh, the benefit of everyone to see which indicators uh, that we prioritize. And then the next step was to uh, look at the different data collection tools and ascertain whether we would be able to collect and report uh, the data on these indicators using the tools that we had. Uh, and of course, the obvious answer was no. So we embarked on reviewing the different uh, data collection tool and making sure uh, these are standardized across board. And some of the standardization 
uh, as part of the standardization exercise, we made sure that, for example, uh, you know, the common data elements across the tools are the same. Uh, you could, for example, find a foster care tool, the way they collect disability uh, related data is different from the tool that is used in, in, uh, in the home. So there was that bit of standardization of uh, how that the different forms, the data elements uh, and, and stuff like that. And then we also developed uh, guidelines uh, articulating roles and responsibilities as well as uh, the data flow processes to ensure that everybody understands uh, this. And at the time, we realized that there was no centralized uh, management information system, uh, particularly for developing very simple uh, Excel-based uh, automated data collection, collection, aggregation and reporting tool. And I'm going to show some of the examples. So for example, when we started working with some of the children homes, we realized, yes, they were collecting uh, data using paper forms, but they had no mechanism for aggregating the data. So we developed simple registers like this. Uh, so you can see here, this is a register for uh, children in care. This allows uh, homes to pull together the individual child level data uh, for each of the child they have in their care. And the culmination of that process is to, uh, it enables them to have a dashboard, like the one that I've uh, projected on this screen, but also it enables them to automatically generate a six monthly data reports uh, that then they submit to uh, the ministry uh, as part of, uh, you know, the regulations. Uh, and, and so that process, of course, now you can see the contrast. We had homes, for example, manually aggregating, but with a different uh, collection and aggregation tools, they're able to produce, for example, um, you know, bulletins at the home level, but also uh, the districts are able to aggregate the data that is reported from the different residential care facilities, and they're able to produce a district alternative care. Uh, what, uh, you know, the way, uh, you know, homes used to collect and report the data, and then on the other extreme end, you can see the, the, the transformation that has happened. And then uh, around our third intervention, uh, focused on uh, building capacity in data use core competences, we've carried out uh, mainly trainings on data analysis, interpretation, visualization, and use at both district and uh, subnational level. But we also um, cut out, a, uh, do a lot of mentorship and support supervision to the children homes, but also to the district to make, to troubleshoot any challenges in using the registers, but also to guide them on, uh, you know, the appropriate forms to use and how to uh, uh, make sense uh, of the data uh, they collect. And you can see, uh, below I've put one of the supervision tools that we developed for children homes and for each home that we visit we collect basic information whether they are using standard tools uh, whether they are you know they have been able to submit reports whether they they were you know they've uh, been able to update their case files but also we check on whether they were able to submit the reports and then discuss any challenges, obstacles that they are facing and help them navigate uh, through that process. And then other interventions focus on engaging data users and producers through data review meetings. Uh, so the culmination of all these processes is that increasingly districts and children homes are able to collect um, and aggregate their data. So we saw it fit to make sure that we organize regular data review meetings where um, stakeholders at the dif district level at also national level come together and, uh, you know, sort of uh, dive deep into the data that has been reported in line with the prioritized indicators. and. Um, we support uh, both the ministry as well as the, the homes to prepare for these meetings by preparing presentations based on the indicators that I shared earlier. And during the meetings, actually, we 
ask questions whether for example data reflects the trends and uh, people explain what uh, the implication of data uh, and and what to do about the data and for each meeting we develop a sort of a prioritized action plan to support uh, improvements in uh, children's care practices as well as uh, support improvements uh, in data quality and here i present an example we had uh, recently uh, a national data review meeting where we pulled together data from the nine districts and you can see uh, these are the kind of presentations and once we present such data we have nuanced discussions for example why is it that uh, yeah, you looking at this data why do you think that um, more than half of the children in care why, why do you think that we can see that more than half of the children in care have at least one living parent? Why is this the case? What can be done? Uh, and then we have those sort of discussions and then we develop action plans around that. Similarly, for example, uh, you can see and the nine districts are presented here. We present graphics like this and say, okay, looking at this data, we see that, that uh, a lot of children are overstaying in residential care. And you can see from the graph, for example, Kamuli, about 71% of the children have been in care for uh, more than six years. So we ask uh, questions. Why is this the case? What are the challenges in reintegrating children? Um, you know, what kind of support would you need from probation officers to uh, make sure, and, and from the central government to make sure children are safely reintegrated? And then, based on those discussions, we are able to agree uh, on a plan, uh, including a follow up plan to make sure that action is taken to address some of the issues that are surfaced through data. Uh, what are some of the successes uh, in the interest of time? One is that uh, since we started this work, we've uh, seen uh, attitudes towards data gradually shifting. A lot of people are uh, beginning to appreciate uh, uh, why data is important and the value data can add to their work. And increasingly, there is a keenness to collect uh, and report data uh, in the districts at least that we work with, but also uh, based on the discussions in the, you know, during the data review meetings and through regular support supervision visits, we've noticed uh, some uh, changes in the case management practices, uh, you know, um, especially around documenting, uh, for example, uh, you know, case reviews, uh, documenting, uh, you know, uh, visits by parents to homes we've seen uh, improvement in uh, documentation of uh, uh, you know uh, family tracing and social work visits and improvement in collection of data we've uh, over the years uh, used this data to engage the government and lobby uh, especially the minister of gender to allocate uh, some money to the alternative care unit and uh, you know uh, beginning the financial year uh, uh, last financial year each quarter the 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 alternative care unit has now is, is is given some money to support inspections and monitoring of homes and we think that has uh, been uh, as a result of increased appreciation and surfacing of this data and engaging with the, uh, the decision makers at the national level with uh, this data and you know why it is necessary to uh, support these uh, homes so there is uh, it's not much money it's about uh, it's uh, quarterly it's about five thousand us dollars that is given to uh, the unit but i we think that's a positive step and, and something that we can build on um, in future. Uh, what are the challenges? Uh, a lot of these challenges uh, uh, Florence mentioned in her presentation, uh, including issues around uh, resources uh, to the ministry, but also the district local government. But our biggest challenge in the beginning is the, the lack of a centralized uh, information, uh, electronic information management system. As I uh, presented earlier, we, 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 we improvised uh, by uh, developing Excel-based sort of tools to enable 
uh, uh, you know, homes and districts collect their data, but we also recognize that these are prone to data quality uh, errors uh, and, and loss or corruption of data, but also people struggle a lot with Excel. Um, uh, over the last one year and a half, uh, both ends believing uh, started rolling out the alternative care management information system, and they've uh, the, currently, they've covered around uh, 155 out of 157 approved children homes. But the limitation of the system is that, yes, it's good for residential care facilities, but uh, it hasn't been expanded yet to cover other forms of care, uh, such as foster care. Um, uh, you know, and, and also, uh, there are uh, limitations uh, regarding, you know, uh, its ability, for example, to track uh, children longitudinally that uh, eventually, uh, you know, uh, reintegrated with uh, their families. But I know the team is working hard to improve uh, the system, and, and I think that will be um, a very good plus for the country. Uh, the other challenge is uh, uh, a lot of times we're asking uh, social workers to collect data and they see it as a sort of an extra burden. Uh, a lot of uh, the interactions we have, we say, oh, but we have to do all the casework and the case management and you're asking us to document and fill numbers. So it sort of adds to their workloads and that sometimes can be uh, a challenge. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are mandated to collect data and use data, these are trained social workers. They do not have any background in sort of uh, monitoring and evaluation, but you're asking them to interpret the data and, you know, draw implications from the data. It, uh, and, and we've carried out, uh, out a lot of trainings to improve data literacy, but still a lot of uh, efforts are needed. And of course, Florence talked about resource constraints. Uh, for example, um, if we ask the district local governments to convene data review meetings, they are not able to because they do not have funding. But also the expectation is that the probation officers should uh, conduct uh, routine inspections and collect particular data. But unfortunately, uh, at times, the inspections and monitoring of children's homes uh, do not probation officer have specific mandates relating to foster care including placement of children and monitoring of children placed in foster care and there are specific data that is required but unfortunately this is rarely collected because they do not have money to monitor those placements and collect specific data that uh, is pertinent to understanding the situation of children uh, in these various uh, placements uh, some of the lessons, and I'll go through Ishmael, this. Ishmael, I'm quick. sorry, um, I'm going to have to rush you a little bit because we've, we've kind of run out of time. Uh, perhaps you could just okay. go through these super quickly and we'll um, people can look at them, uh, they can review the PowerPoints, which we'll include in the Google Drive folder. And if, if, uh, just minute. to say, if, if anyone has any questions, just type them in the chat box, otherwise we'll go straight into the next presentation after you've finished. Okay, uh, I'll just go through this one minute. Uh, mm -hmm. One is that uh, we've realized that m and &E capacity building is, of course, uh, a long-term effort. You need to uh, develop a long-term collaborative approach. Um, we've uh, talked about the need to understand the constraints. Uh, Florence mentioned this can be behavioral, organizational, technical, or political, or all, all the above. So you need to understand uh, all these barriers and then systematically address them uh, in a very comprehensive and integrated way. And also we realize that buy-in from uh, the top leadership is important. Uh, if you don't have buy-in, uh, then I, I think you like your efforts are likely to prove futile. And then, of course, if you are to build a culture of data use, people, different actors in the system should feel confident um, and trust in the quality of the data. So it's essential to uh, invest efforts in uh, ensuring uh, data quality. Um, thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Ishmael. That was a fantastic presentation and really, really good to have those examples from um, the ground in Uganda. I'm going to um, hand over now to Nicole Petrosky from the Statistics and Monitoring, uh, Statistics and Monitoring Specialist in the Child Protection and Development um, in the Data and Analytics Section, Division of Data, um, Analytics Planning and Monitoring in UNICEF, New York. Hi, Nicole. It's really great to have us with you. And uh, I know it's quite early there for both you and Florence over in New York. Um, Nicole's going to give us a bit of a case study and example on using administrative data to routinely collect information on children's care. So over to you, Nicole. Thanks so much um, and a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for um, inviting uh, UNICEF to have the opportunity to share with you um, the work that uh, we've been doing around, um, you know, working with countries to try to strengthen uh, the, the availability, the quality and the use of, of data on, on children in alternative care. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's hope this works. Just one minute. Is everyone able to see my screen? Uh, it looks perfect from where I'm sitting, okay. yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Um, just let me hide this. Okay, so I'm gonna try to be super quick um, and share with you a bit of the work that we've been doing, as I said, around strengthening data on children um, in alternative care. So we always start first with a um, you know consideration of of thinking about you know what is a country's needs when it comes to the data. So um, you know the first step is always to really identify okay what kind of data you know uh, are needed and then trying to match that with you know how what kind of data what are the data needs and then matching it with what um, are the available data sources or where you know what kind of data sources do we need to have to be able to generate the type of data that is needed so we um, sort of think about you know there can be a need to have you know account to have a mapping of you know all for instance residential care facilities in a country and be able to regularly collect basic information about those facilities um, of course there's a need um, sometimes to be able to have a, of course complete records of all children that are in different alternative care arrangements whether it's residential care care, foster care, adoption type situations. So having complete records of those children, where they are, the numbers, um, and then of course, information that's needed for case management and that those need to be regularly like updated. And then we also, of course, want to understand how children in alternative care are doing in terms of a number of areas of well-being. So we want to understand also, um, you know, how are they doing in terms of um, their education? How are they doing in terms of, um, you know, health factors or nutrition, for instance? So we've, what we have tried to do is think about these sort of different data needs and then start to try to think about developing tools and materials and things that can address some of these data needs. So I'm going to um, talk about some of the some of the tools and some of the things that we've been developing to try to address some of these these data needs. The first is um, uh, that many of you might be um, familiar or aware of is a data collection protocol on children in residential care. So the objectives of the protocol is um, there's two phases of data collection. In the first phase, um, it's really like a census of residential care facilities in a country. So really doing a mapping and a census of all residential care facilities. And then within of all those within all of those facilities doing a thorough enum enumeration, so a count of children living in the facilities and also capturing some basic uh, demographic characteristics about the children, like their sex, their age, uh, you know, how long they've been living in the facility, um, exa for example. So essentially going to every facility, both registered and non-registered. So one of the objectives of the protocol is to try to come up with a complete um, universe of all of the facilities um, in a country, um, not just those that are necessarily government run or, or um, you know, state run, but are also ones that might be um, operating, you know, unregistered. 
um, and then doing essentially going to all of those facilities and essentially putting together a roster. So a, a, a roster of all of the children in that facility. So that's sort of like the phase one of the data collection. Then we've designed a phase two, which is essentially a follow-up survey of child well-being. And we take essentially a representative sample of children that we've collected from the first phase. We take a representative sample. We go back to those facilities, you know, the children that have been selected to, for inclusion in the sample. And then we administer a number of um, questionnaires and tools to try to collect some information about the different measures of their well being. So we collect information about, um, you know, for instance, a number of health indicators. We collect information about, you know, disciplinary practices that are used with the children. We collect information about their developmental status, how they're doing in terms of, um, you know, developmental outcomes. Um, we collect information um, uh, that's, you know, interesting about to know about case management. So like, where were the children before they came into the residential care facility? Do they still have contact with relatives? Um, is there siblings living in the facility with them? All of these types of things. And many of the tools um, that we use for that follow-up survey are essentially um, the same questionnaires or adapted versions of questionnaires from the multiple indicator cluster surveys, which is the UNICEF supported household survey program. So um, we've taken many of those questionnaires, which were designed as household questionnaires, and we've adapted them for use with this institutional population. So instead of asking the questions, of course, of the mother or the primary caregiver in the household of the children, we're asking the questions of, you know, a knowledgeable adult in the facility who, um, you know, hopefully is one of the, the regular caregivers of the specific child that we're asking the questions about. Uh, we also have a dedicated questionnaire in that follow-up survey for the social workers. Um, and those are the questions that are more around uh, the, some of the case management type, type questions about, you know, did the child come in through um, through the appropriate gatekeeping mechanisms? Do they have a care order? Do they have an assigned social worker? How often is their care plan reviewed? Do they have a care plan, et cetera? Um, um, these, this information that we collect is one thing to flag is it's really not meant to replace administrative records. So we, in many countries um, that we've been sort of implementing the protocol in, they've wanted to use this as an opportunity to create a baseline. So be able to capture and have um, an accurate um, number in terms of the facilities and also the children and, and use that as a basis to then go ahead and form a more formal case management system and be able to start, you know, tracking those children um, through in the system and regular doing, you know, regular updating of the information. But this is, you know, not meant to replace um, the data collection that we're, we're that we've designed is not meant to replace um, the administrative records, but can um, hopefully um, in some context be used almost as like a starting point to be able to then build build up and strengthen the administrative records. So the package, um, the package that we've designed, it includes a full on protocol that um, outlines all of the recommended steps for gathering the data. So like, how do you go about designing the census and the survey, everything from training of the interviewers to sampling considerations, to, um, you know, instructions for interviewers on how to administer the questionnaire. So it's a very complete and comprehensive package protocol. Um, there are 12 data collection tools and questionnaires um, across the two phases of the data collection. So some questionnaires um, that are implemented during phase one and then some questionnaires implemented during um, phase two. So we have a total of 12 um, tools and questionnaires that are used for across both phases of the data collection. The questionnaires um, as of now have also been translated in, in French and Spanish. And then we also have, um, along with the protocols, a comprehensive implementation package, which includes um, a number of you know, additional materials that a country would need to be able to implement the protocol from tabulation plans when you get to the analysis stage to the syntaxes, the, the, the data processing syntaxes. So we really tried to provide a full package 
um, that countries can essentially just like take it on and be able to implement it, of course, with um, technical support and assistance from us, um, which we're happy to provide as requested. One of the really great things about the protocol and one of the strengths is that it covers so many indicators. So we cover about over 70 indicators um, and many of these are SDG indicators. So for the first time, um, we're able to um, collect data on, you know, the population of children living in residential care and um, on some, S some SDG indicators. So for instance, stunting, for instance, um, normally that information is collected through, you know, household surveys, which of course don't capture children living in institutions. So this is an opportunity for a country to be able to collect information about um, on many SDG indicators like stunting, for instance, or exposure to violent discipline um, among this particular um, population, of, uh, uh, population of children. So I just wanted to quickly share with you a couple of um, results so that you, from um, the application of the, the protocol in Ghana. So Ghana um, to date is the only country that has done, has implemented the protocol at scale. So they did an, uh, they implemented the protocol at national level in, in 2019. Um, there's a link here to the, the re full report um, that you can access. And I'm just gonna really quickly go through an, um, a couple of the findings just to illustrate the type of data that can, that is collected and can be produced, um, the type of results that can be produced through um, implementing the protocol. So of course, as I mentioned, um, the one of the main purposes is to be able to get a count and a, really a census of the number of residential homes, the number of facilities in, in a country or in an area of a country. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be done at national level. And I'll, I'll share a couple examples where we've implemented the protocol just in a, in a particular area of the country. Um, so here you can see, you know, we identified 139 residential homes um, for children in Ghana. And we were able to see that most of them were concentrated in the greater Accra region. And then you can see the number of homes there across the different regions of the country. We also collect, um, of course, as I mentioned, a, a count and enumeration of the number of children in residential homes. So in those 139 homes, we found um, about 3,500 uh, children living in the homes. There was um, slightly more boys than girls, which was already sort of a known fact in, in the case of Ghana, though there was a little bit more boys than girls living in residential homes. So you have about 57% of children in residential care are, are boys. And then the graph on the right hand side is um, the percentage distribution of children living in residential care by age. Um, so the, the top bar there is, uh, is out of all children in residential care. So about um, out, out of all children in residential care, about two and three um, are age 10 and older. So that's the, the green part plus that um, sort of gold, goldy brown part. So about two and three are, are slightly older um, children at, at age 10 or older. We also, as I mentioned, collect information um, to understand some of the um, background characteristics of the children as part of the phase two, the follow-up survey. So we can get kind of a profile of children that are in residential care. So in the case of Ghana, for instance, um, as Ishmael was even mentioning um, in his presentation, you know, about two and three children that we found to be living in residential care, in fact, do have at least one living biological parent. So, I mean, many of us, I think, who probably work in this field, it's, it, we sort of recognize and it's well known that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a misconception that children living in residential care are orphans. Um, and of course, this data uh, reconfirmed th that fact that, um, you know, two out of three children that are living in residential care in Ghana, in fact, actually have at least one living um, biological parent. As I mentioned, we also collect information about a number of areas of well-being of children. Um, for instance, here you have um, a number of indicators about malnutrition. So in the case of, in the case of Ghana, we found that about 40% of children under the age of five that were living in residential um, homes were um, considered moderately or severely stunted. And this is the official SDG indicator. So now, for instance, as I was mentioning, we have these data for Ghana to be able to say for the SDG indicator on stunting, we know that um, about 40% of children, which is it's that proportion is much higher than we see in the sort of general household population in the country. 
We've also been doing some additional um, testing and uptake of the protocol um, over the last two years. So we had, um, when we were still very much in the process of the methodological work and refining and testing of the protocol, um, we had participation from both India and Kazakhstan um, who tested the protocol in one area of the country um, in March, 2020. So they, um, they only did it in one particular area of the country. It wasn't done nationally at scale. Um, Uruguay also um, on their own um, between uh, the UNICEF country office in Uruguay and the National Institute for Children and Adolescents. They took on the protocol and used many of the tools and adapted it to conduct a national census on children in residential care also in 2020 in the country. Um, Uzbekistan um, just recently completed um, testing and, and use of the protocol in uh, November, December of last year. Um, again, they implemented it in just one region of the country. So right now they're in the process of doing the data analysis and the data processing um, for the results. And same with Pakistan. So they also um, um, earlier this year completed data collection in, in Punjab province um, and are now in the process of doing the data analysis. So we're still um, sort of in this stage of, of sort of testing getting countries to sort of implement the protocol and, and continuing to learn from, from those experiences. We have a dedicated um, web uh, web page on our data.unicef.org site that has um, the protocol. It has the questionnaires, as I mentioned, and um, that have been translated in French and Spanish um, and other materials related to, to the protocol um, and, um, and, and the data collection can be found um, on our website. So really quickly, some of the, the big, like I think key takeaways and lessons learned that we've that we've gotten through these different um, experiences. And again, this is just a few of them. We have many more. There's a link here to an article um, that we published um, in an academic journal where we describe and sort of talk about um, the testing and some of the lessons that we've learned. And uh, so a big one, um, as and, and many of these are actually ones that Ishmael was, um, was already sort of mentioning, is you know the importance of strong relationships, buy-in, and commitment from key partners, especially from government, right at the outset. And you know, and this is in order to make sure that the, the data and the results um, are going to be useful, um, that they're going to be used, and that they're also going to be um, endorsed um, by the government. So we we encourage um, establishing like a technical working group at country level. We encourage, um, as part of implementing the protocol, that you have involvement of, ideally, preferably, the National Statistical Office. We recommend to be the ones actually implementing the data collection whenever possible um, with strong involvement and leadership from the ministry that, of course, has the mandate for alternative uh, of care because they'll be the ones, of course, taking forward the results. Also being really clear on the objectives and the desired outcome. So how are the data going to be used? What do you want to be able to say with the resulting data? Um, this is really important to um, outline and to agree on at the outset, again, to make sure that the data that are being collected are going to be useful and that they're going to be um, used in a concrete way. Um, we also have been finding that um, there's a really um, important need for adequate training and monitoring of the fieldwork teams to ensure data quality and adherence to ethical protocols. In many of the cases um, in the countries that we've you know, used the protocol in up to now, the data collection teams, the interviewers, they are, um, many of them are experienced interviewers. So they're, um, they're experienced with doing in-person interviews, but generally in the context of a household survey. So many of them have never been in an institution, have never been exposed to children in institutional care. So there's a need to um, ensure that we um, allow sufficient time um, to train the interviewers, not just on how to administer the questionnaires, but also preparing them mentally and emotionally for what it can mean to go into an institution and see these children. Um, and as part of the implementation package, we've developed very comprehensive training materials um, to implement the protocol that includes these elements of, you know, preparing the interviewers um, for situations they might encounter in the field and also um, encouraging time for, you know, debriefing with the interviewers um, and ensuring that they, that, that they're, um, that they're prepared and that, they're, that their own, um, you know, mental health is also taken care of because, um, for, as I said, for many of them, it's a new experience uh, to go into um, an institutional setting. And also the last thing is to not really underestimate 
um, the fact that, you know, implementing this protocol, it does require significant um, and dedicated capacity and resources. So there really needs to be somebody at country level sort of leading the process, sort of somebody who's um, like a survey coordinator or survey manager um, who's managing all of the aspects. It is a, it is a big undertaking, even when it's, um, you know, in one area of the country, it's a census. It's, you know, you're visiting all of the facilities in an area or in the country. You're doing a very rigorous type of data collection. So it is something to, um, you know, something to be considered up front that it's, um, you know, it, it requires, you know, having somebody on the ground who can sort of be quite dedicated um, to this, to this effort. We've also, and I know I'm running over time, so I'll try to be super quick. So we've also tried to um, develop um, a supplementary um, protocol and interview guide to conduct some qualitative semi-structured semi interviews with families and parents of children that are living in residential care. So um, the idea here is to try to understand and unpack a bit further the drivers behind child separation and placement in residential care. So like the other protocol, we have a protocol for this data collection. We have the interview guides um, for both the one-on-one -on -one interviews with um, families and parents and also to do focus group discussions with staff in the residential care facilities. And the idea is that this, um, this supplementary protocol can either be done as a standalone effort for data collection, or it can be appended to the, the other protocol that I was mentioning as another follow-up. And then when it comes to strengthening sort of administrative um, data, we've developed um, a toolkit for country level self-evaluation to help countries assess sort of where their current uh, this sort of effectiveness and maturity of their administrative data system when it comes to collecting data on, on children and alternative care and adoption. And the idea is to help um, countries be able to really identify bottlenecks, barriers, um, and areas where, you know, improvement are needed and where the investment can be um, targeted. So it's composed of two questionnaires. One is a questionnaire that's um, completed jointly by stakeholders um, in the country. So the idea is to have sort of like a workshop, you bring together the stakeholders, um, the relevant stakeholders in the country and they jointly sort of complete the questionnaire. And then we also have separate um, sectoral questionnaires so that every sort of sector can also sort of assess and score themselves in terms of their data system and see where there might be some weaknesses and, and areas for improvement. Um, these are the different elements that are assessed in the um, toolkit. I won't go through them, um, but just to say that these are the different areas. So we, we, we look at sort of like, you know, data transmission, data quality assurance um, procedures. So the, there's a series of questions on these different components. And the idea is, is that you go through the questionnaire, you, you know, complete it, self-assessment. And then there's a, a scoring um, matrix in there to help countries see sort of on the continuum from a very strong administrative data data system to a more weak administrative data system, where on that continuum do they fall in these different areas? So because we assess the areas separately, you can sort of see, you know, you might have a country that, oh, they realize they're very strong in sort of legal and normative frameworks, um, but they're, you know, really struggling with data transmission. So it can really help identify where are those bottlenecks and those barriers in order to help, um, in order to help target um, the investments that are needed. We also, as part of the toolkit, have a set of indicators um, that are um, really derived, meant to be um, indicators with data that can be derived from administrative data systems. So we've um, looked and reviewed um, a number of different existing indicator sets from Transmini to Better Care Network to the Data Care Project. And we've identified sort of a, what we're considering a minimum core set of recommended indicators, which is currently the, the, the number of indicators is 19. Um, and these are really indicators about um, what we see is sort of being ideally what would be sort of the all the indicators that all countries ideally would be able to monitor and report regularly through their administrative data system. So these are indicators like number of residential care facilities, number of children in residential care, number of children entering or leaving residential care, you know, during the year, number of children in foster care. Um, so it's these types of indicators, not, for instance, policy indicators or indicators about monitoring care reform. Um, those, of course, are important indicators, but the ones that we've selected and that we're focused on are really quantitative in nature and, and indicators that can be derived from the administrative data system. And the indicators are part of the toolkit, meaning that 
when a country does the, implements the toolkit and does the self-assessment, they also assess the extent to which they're able to collect the data and report on the data for each of those 19 indicators. So what's next? So we're in sort of like a phase two of many of this work. Um, again, as I said, we're continuing to support countries with strengthening availability, quality, and use of data on children on alternative care um, with um, technical and financial support from USAID over the next couple of years to be able to um, really provide some tailor and, um, tailored and targeted technical assistance and resources to a subset of, of countries to really help them um, uptake and implement the different tools that I mentioned. So helping them identify which of those different tools is gonna to be of greatest relevance and use to them. And then actually walking with them through the process of implementing those tools, whether it's the protocol, whether it's doing the qualitative interviews, well, it's, whether it's um, implementing the toolkit. So which of the different sort of suite of tools that we have and um, are of greatest um, use to a country and then actually helping provide that technical assistance with, um, with implementation. So we've, we've through our, our child protection regional advisors, we put out a call for proposals from our country offices um, to, to submit an expression of interest to, to come on board and be a part of this sort of multi-year um, program of work. And um, we've received proposals from 15 countries. So we're now reviewing those and we'll be probably um, selecting about five or six. That's sort of the amount that we have to be able to, from, from a resource and, and capacity standpoint in our team that we'll be able to support over the next couple of years with really this kind of more like tar um, tailored and targeted um, technical assistance. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Nicole. That was a great presentation. Really clear. Thank you very much. Um, we've slightly uh, run out of time. So if anyone has any burning questions, please just type them into the chat box. And perhaps while you're doing that, I'll just hand over to Mona just to make a couple of announcements about the platform and when the next webinar is going to be. Over to you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, maybe before um, I make the announcements, I'd like to first of all extend my appreciation to uh, the presenters, the three presenters we had uh, today. So that is uh, to Florence uh, of BCN of Better Care Network, Ismail of Child Frontiers, and Nicole, colleague from UNICEF headquarters data and analytics, um, for this for being able to present uh, a very comprehensive, you know, information on the importance of data and the various uh, initiatives ongoing to ensure that we have strong data when it comes to care. Um, I would also like to thank you, Emily, uh, Bertha, and Ismail for all the work behind the scenes to organize this webinar. And maybe before we close, uh, one announcement. Um, there is an upcoming webinar that will be on the 28th of July um, at, at 11 a.m. Nairobi time. And this webinar will be on key lessons learned from COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic and care uh, and care reform. We'll have an overview of learning from across the region based on a literature review and key informant um, interviews and examples from Malawi, Kenya, and Uganda that will be illustrating um, this learning on COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 and, and child care reform. So with that, I thank you and I pass it back to you, Emily, in case there are any questions in the chat box. Uh, so we don't have any questions coming out. Um, I think everybody was just uh, so the presentations were so comprehensive. Nobody had any anything else that they needed information on. So I think it's a sign of three really interesting and comprehensive presentations. Thank you so much. And just to say, um, we have been uh, repeatedly putting in the chat box, um, and I'll ask Bertha just to do it one last time, um, uh, information about our uh, monthly newsletter and how you can subscribe to that. Um, if you're able to do that, then that will give you all of the information about the future webinars and how to join those webinars um, as we move ahead. Um, and I don't think we have any questions, so I think we'll finish up there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye now.